to introduce our final speaker, Jessie Frizzell, the queen of containers. And her fun fact is that uh, she pronounces the control key, Curdle. Love it. There's Jessie, a long everybody. story behind that. I mean, not really long in that I just inverted the letters when I was very little and it stuck. And I cannot get rid of the habit. So there's that. It's really awkward when it comes out and people don't know and they're like, what the hell are you talking about? So yeah, uh, today I'm going to be talking about the internals of the Go Linker and kind of the way that I approach this because I wanted it to be approachable to people who don't know what a linker is and then people who want to kind of know more in-depth items is that we're going to go over some basics first and then I'm going to get into some nitty-gritty details in the forms of looking at really weird bugs and really weird things that you might want to do when you compile things. So. Let's get started. <laughs> I also have another title for it, which is the Hold My Beer of Go Build, because we'll get into some really weird stuff. Um, but that will come after. So what is a linker? Um, who here knows what a linker is? Cool. OK. So what a linker does is it takes like all these libs and then also objects that are built uh, when you, at compile time. And so you kind of send all those to LD. And then it either gives you, if you want a, if you are compiling a library or a package, um, or you are compiling your like executable item. So it will output those. So it inputs libraries and outputs a library as well, or it could input libraries and objects and then also output a uh, actual binary. So that's pretty neat. Um, so there's two different types of linking. There is dynamic linking and static linking. I prefer the static type, but I will, of course, tell you the difference between the two. So dynamic linking is pretty cool um, in that it works like this. So you have your executable, um, and it has a bunch of undefined symbols. And then at run, all these symbols resolve from your local libraries. So there are a few advantages to this in that updating libraries is, uh, is easier because you can actually just update the library. You don't have to recompile your binaries. Uh, and then multiple binaries can then link to the same libraries. Um, so that's super nice. Um, there are some disadvantages in that like this is not as portable because then you have to like install all these stupid libraries along with your thing, which is also why I hate it um, or prefer you know static linking. Uh, and then if there is a different version of a library, um, you'd have to kind of manage that in terms of like your other binaries. Uh, and then it also might like break your application if you accidentally installed like one version that your app wasn't built on on your local host, which you know is also what containers solve. So there's that. Um, and then there's static linking where everything kind of gets it's combined into one, which is why I love it. But there are some disadvantages in that you have to recompile your binary if, like, say, OpenSSL has a bug, which, of course, it does. Um, so the advantages are, though, it's super portable. So you could just SCP this thing over, you know, way back in the day before Kubernetes. Just SCP it on the server and run. And in a screen session, you know, don't even make a systemd unit file. Why? So yeah, these were all the slides that I had because I actually like slides. So now we're going to get into some more nitty gritty things a bit. Let me find my pointer. Cool. This is super weird and that I can't actually see what I'm doing because Linux. Fun times. Um, let me just do the super get away of doing this. Do not judge me. <laughs> Uh, yeah, who runs Linux on the desktop here? <laughs> okay, so now we're just going to XRDV. You all did not know that you were going to learn this today as well. It's super fun. Cool. Sweet. Okay, so that looks pretty good. That was not part of the talk, but you know, fun times. Uh, <laughs> sweet. So what was left in my agenda? OK, so if we just go into this <laughs> application that I have, sorry, I've had a lot of talks this week, so I might get lost. That's why I have notes. Um, I have a super, super basic main.go here, like the one that uh, like vimgo generates for you, except I changed it to hello Gotham go instead of vimgo. So super 
normal thing here. So normally when you want to compile this, you do like obviously go build, and that's all you'd run, right? So we get our binary, right? It's in our directory. Um, we can see it, that's cool. So who here has used the command uh, LDD? It's a good command, right? I kind of love it. So a lot of like, if you are familiar with what I've done with containers, like all those desktop images, I had to find like the libraries that those binaries wanted to run. So LDD is like your best friend for that because you're like, what do I need to install? It will tell you. So this one's static, which is fine. Um, but let's give an example of one that I'll compile that will not be if we go into one that's a little bit more intense than obviously our hello world, which we will use later as well. Um, I can come in here and I'll do a make dash n just so that you can kind of see what's going to happen. What was that? Oh, that was stupid. So uh, what this is going to call is go build, but there's some extra LD flags in here, and those dash X are compile time variables. Who here has used those? Okay, I love those too. There's a fun thing that we're going to get into with those later. So um, this all seems pretty standard, uh, honestly. So if we just make this. I did not anticipate that this one took so long. So what we can see here is now that we're linking into all these libraries. Um, so if it's not, if it is a static thing, it will say not a dynamic executable, obviously. But all of these, um, especially libseccomp is kind of one to look out for. That's something that we purposely were loading through CGO and stuff like that. So uh, it's nice to know that you can kind of backtrace where your things are getting linked. And then you can also do um, something really cool, which if I go back into the other one, and I believe that uh, Filippo showed this in his talk. Um, if we do a go build dash x, you can actually see the each command that is running in your go build. So the second to last one there is link, which is the linker for uh, go itself, uh, which we will now get into. Um, sorry, my notes just disappeared. Cool. So. Uh, if we open my directory where Go is. Sorry, I'm just kidding. Typing is hard. Okay. Uh, so command link lives there, and then internally in here we have like a few various different things. The actual code for the linker lives in LD. So if we look in there, there's a bunch of files. But a lot of stuff in here is actually per architecture. Um, so if we look at uh, what AMD64 is doing in the object file, um, we can see that all of these are actually um, hard coded. So the first bug that we are going to kind of go through uh, in terms of what's happening is something with these. And I will show it in another window that I bring up. Oh my gosh, I really am just not happy with Linux right now. Cool. This one. So, oh, I guess we could do it side by side like that. That's fine. Thanks, I3. Um, so, <laughs> uh, this is actually who here has used Alpine for containers and stuff? Okay, so this is a common thing. And if you are using Go in Alpine and you like uh, compiled your Go yourself or anything, uh, there's actually like a certain set of patches that you need to compile dynamic uh, binaries on Go because the uh, default like linker uh, is not right. So what is actually kind of funny about this is that since these are hard coded like this, uh, the Linux one is pointing to the obvious path where the Linux one is. And at first when I saw this, I was like, I wonder why they hard coded them all. It turns out there's like an actual spec that says that this is what it's supposed to be. So that makes total sense why they hard coded it all. But then Alpine just uses this like entirely arbitrary path that is not like in the spec. And then you, you like if you look here, uh, it's kind of funny because uh, like Ian winds up being the one saying that the spec actually says that it should be one way. Sorry, wow, Chrome, here we go. He's like, the ELF ABI supplement for the relevant processor like defines these paths. And then I was like, oh, I'm gonna look up what the ELF ABI supplement is. And then when I did, Ian wrote it. 
<laughs> Let me just bring that up. The first one I Googled just happened to be for PowerPC, though. Um, but yeah, he definitely wrote it. There's Ian's name. And I was like, oh, that's ironic. He's so modest. Why didn't he just say that? Um, so yeah, that's why those are like that. Um, <laughs> I just kind of figured that I would explain that. But so the things that these are doing actually, like the LD.SO, that is what does the runtime linking for dynamic binaries. So that's what finds these libraries at runtime and then links and then executes all your code, uh, which is really cool. But yeah, these paths are defined by a spec and then people just ignore the spec because of course, you know, computers. So <laughs> yeah, that was kind of the first bug that I really wanted to get into. Um, and then there's also a few other bugs with Alpine that I'm trying to fix, but that was uh, just one of them. So another thing that actually happened uh, personally to us at Docker when I worked there, and this happened at a Friday at night, of course, because all bugs, you know, all the worst bugs happen at Friday at night. So um, what we had problems with were the dash x flags, the compile time variables. Uh, so let me bring this one up. And then I'll do this. Actually, I'll just, I think I can do this. Or I'll just X this. Sweet. OK, so this was a long time ago. This was actually, I think, like one of the first issues that I've ever opened to go, and I was so nervous because one, we could not reproduce it without like forcing them to compile Docker. And I was like, ah, they're going to hate us. Um, so I was like, hey, just make in the Docker repo. <laughs> this is super bad. Um, <laughs> So what was happening was we had updated to a new version of Go, and our um, binaries just weren't working. And a lot of this came down to this file that is like the Docker version .go file at the time. And that was where we were doing these, like, you know, uh, creating these uh, compile time variables. So it was the weirdest bug, because if you actually added in this package an empty init, all of a sudden everything worked. And we were like, this is just really weird. Um, and then if you, if you went back like certain commits, so certain commits worked, certain commits didn't. And it was just like the weirdest thing because like that behavior is not something that's consistent at all, which is also why I was like, I'm so sorry. Like you can only reproduce this in really weird ways um, because like this patch works this, or these patches failed, but then like master works. It's super weird. Um, so of course, like, please clone Docker and compile it. I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it turns out <laughs> all the way down here. And then like Dave at one point is like, did you LDD? And I was like, of course I LDD'd it. Like, <laughs> um, so it turns out what was happening was one of our compile time variables was a Boolean. If you look here, it's like, we just pass in this thing. I am static just so that like internally to ourselves, we know that it's a static binary and we're passing in true which is a boolean and these uh compile time flags they can only be strings so what we were doing was shifting a bit and then somehow in the way it was compiling it was shifting a bit every single time so that's why it was so inconsistent but like what the hell you guys computers <laughs> like uh so all the credit on fixing this goes to one of the members on the, this guy like seriously, I don't know how he figured that out because we weren't even really showing them that stuff. It just happened to be in like the logs of like that we were setting it to a Boolean. And he was like, I think that that's a bool. Like, whoa. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's also not something that we can necessarily like catch and then be like, you just put a bool in as your compile time variable. So that kind of sucks. So that's a good lesson to learn. Do not do that. Um, but yeah, compile time variables are really cool other than if you like shift the bit. Something about that version of Go shifted a bit that made it like really, really volatile. Like <laughs> super weird. So uh, there's that one. And then the most fun one, in my opinion, I lost my mouse. Oh my God, how embarrassing all my Linux on the desktop problems today. Okay, so um, who here has like written C and used like a DL open for a plugin? OK, so this is pretty common. Uh, and it, it's a lot of like dynamic kind of loading of libraries and stuff. Um, so we had the instance at Docker as well uh, where we wanted to DL open something. Um, but the problem is like we really liked 
you know, static binaries. Like, that's a really great thing about Go. And, you know, if you're shipping just one binary to a computer to run Docker, you don't want to have to just include some random, like, uh, thing that you're going to then DL open, you know? So, like, I started looking into it, and it turns out you can DL open yourself, which sounds really weird, but <laughs> it's really cool. It's also what we dubbed the MacGyver of DL opening, so. So, <laughs> let's just take a look at what we have in here. Um, yeah, if we go into source. Okay, so I have these two C files, and if we open them up, uh, it's, it's really standard, like a, just a print, and it's taking in an argument. So we're going to use these uh, as symbols and then DL open ourselves and export them. Um, but let's look at the other one too. It's also super basic, but it's going to take the square root of something. Um, and, random argument that you pass in, it will take the square root of it and then like throw something back out. So just super simple functions here just to like show that this works. Uh, what else do I have in here? Here we go. Okay, so we have our CGO, right? And then we have um, this run, which is going to DL open our thing um, and then we handle the error if that fails. Hopefully it doesn't. Um, and then we're going to find the entry point, the symbol, uh, which we're passing in because arbitrarily it just like randomly did functions. Uh, and then we run that thing. So, um, yeah, this was really just to prove that you could do this, but all we're doing is calling those C, C files. Um, just as if they were something that you would DL open. And then right here, like it's just doing this uh, stupid unsaved top pointer because of C, sorry. Uh, and then it's gonna run our function based off like what you pass in. So first one's hello, which calls that one DL open of the hello world file. And then the second one's the square root run, which will then DL open the square root. And then it will, uh, do that on 16. So, okay. So the way you do this is with some really fun LD flags. If we look at our make file, um, uh, by the way, make, the, the most beautiful part about make is that everything is a dependency, as you can see here. So first we compile our like hello world.o uh, from the hello world.c, and then we compile our like square root uh, object from the square root.c. And then uh, when we compile MacGyver, <laughs> it requires obviously these. God, I love make. And then um, <laughs> uh, these tags, the static build one is just like, it's just made up. I, I just like it for like uh, consistency reasons. It's nice to know. Uh, I have like weird OCD about that. So then we're passing in LD flags and we're actually, instead of using the internal linker for Go, we're gonna use the external one because all these crazy flags <laughs> are not necessarily supported by the internal one. Usually the internal one would honestly work for everything. So our extra flags here are, um, you know, show me all the errors because I'm an insane person. Um, this whole archive is actually going to make sure that like every single symbol is exported because the thing about linkers is if it's not actually going to execute that code, if it doesn't think that it has to execute it, it's not going to export it. Like it's not going to give you that symbol because it's like, I don't need it. Why would I give it to you? Um, so right here, you're like, give me everything. I don't care. Um, and then export dynamic is going to make sure that uh, everything is kind of exported as well. And then uh, uh, we're going to take our uh, object files as well, put those in there, and then we're going to turn off the whole archive because after we have those objects that we want to export all the symbols for in our object files, we don't need everything else um, because really all we're looking for is the symbol that says hello and the symbol that says square root uh, that we need exported that the compiler doesn't know that we need, but we need it. Um, and then these are just like adding in the libraries. 
and then we're doing going to output it as MacGyver. So uh, if we do this. Uh, and then just to show for fun, Giver, um, you can see that it's not actually statically linked. I was trying to do this as a static binary for the longest time, and I was just like, it didn't work. But it does work dynamically for deal opening yourself, so that's cool. And then we can use nm, who's used the nm command, because it's really cool too. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, it's like I get to show all my like, really weird tools. Um, so nm is pretty dope. Oops, let me man page this. Uh, it just lists the symbols. Like, Unix is just so cool because there's a tool for everything. So, yeah. So we're gonna like look for our square root symbol in our binary, and it's there. So like, if I change this actually, to not do this crazy shit, It's not there, obviously. So if we even just like, uh, like you can see obviously all these like Seago things and stuff like that, but like our symbols weren't exported because the compiler is like, you don't need that hello thing. You're never calling it because we actually don't call it from main. We call it as like a passed in argument. Um, so that was kind of the whole point of the process is that it doesn't know because those are just arguments that we're passing in. Um, so. Yeah, let me remake the good one. And then I can also show you that hello is there as well. And then we can run this thing. And it works, which is crazy. So we just DL opened ourselves. You only needed that one thing, and obviously like a Clib, um, glibc, uh, to run this on a computer anywhere else. Um, so there's like a lot of different ways that you can use the linker to your advantage in terms of like how you're trying to ship your binary, which I know a lot of people now just use containers and obviously containers are cool. I get that. Like when I first spoke here in 2014, um, it was one of the first places where like I finished my talk early and I was like, you guys want to see like G parted in a container? Um, so there was that, <laughs> which was not even related to the talk, but it was like one of the first times I showed desktop containers. So yeah, they're cool. But like, uh, depending on how you want to ship your application or depending on what type of like libraries that you're pulling in, there's always like an LD flag for it, which is super dope. And like uh, this didn't even get into like the semantics of like LD preload, which is a whole nother monster of its own. Um, but yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, this was basically all the crazy stuff that I had. So <laughs> if anyone has questions about the linker or anything else, I'm up for it or if there's time, I don't know. Pretty late. Okay. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you, Jesse. I mean, it's Friday afternoon. There's no one after this, so I would say, why don't we take a, two or three questions if there are some? There have got to be questions There's for a Jesse. Question there. Uh, no. the question. But like it will give you, I think like by default a like Don't. pi mode binary. Oh sorry, uh, does the Go linker do anything <laughs> special? Um, not as far as I know, but someone else in the audience might be like, uh, you're wrong right now. Like Alan, Alan's Alan saying you're wrong. Alan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're wrong. <laughs> I think you need to run through the Go linker to deal with reflect types, the R types. You, you need to put oh, that before you go through the, the elf linker to do the final link. Nice. So. JBD shaking her head too. Sweet. <laughs> Today I learned. Other questions? You don't have a, a, a lot of chances to ask Jesse questions, so we, let's make this count. Are there any other questions? Any other questions? Oh, I, I have a question for you. The Jesse Docker image. There's That's an you. image? There's an, I, I see it all the time. It comes like, I, it, there's Talk a- Talk about Debian. Oh, he's making a bad joke again. No, no, I actually was seriously wondering if that was like so all you the, named a, a, a container. Toy that. Story. <laughs> all, yeah, they're all after Toy Story. It's just a good coincidence. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. But I it is the, the best named distro. <laughs> I see it all the time, and I was going to ask. Okay. Uh, we have a question here. What's the use case for opening yourself? 
So the use case was Hold not. On, said, what's the oh, use sorry. case of DL opening? <laughs> you spoke at <laughs> conferences before, right, Jesse? I just get really excited. <laughs> uh, so the use case was we didn't want to have to ship that extra file that we were going to DL open, like the plugin file, uh, because it happened to be like this YubiKey thing. And then you had to have a certain version of it. And it was like this huge shit show of like trying to get that file on people's computers, especially on Linux. Um, so it was like we wanted to try to DL open ourselves instead so that we could, at compile time, have that thing in there. So why don't you statically link? It had to be DL open. It was this terrible. Um, the licensing issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a licensing issue. OK. Oh, maybe. Repeat. Repeat. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so can you use uh, DLSIM to get your own symbol table? So I did get the symbol table to call the symbols that I wanted to call since I pass them in as arguments. But I think that you can dump the whole table, too. Um, I'm not sure. All right. With that, thank you, Jesse. Thank you very much, Jesse.